I think that really turned out well, and we've got Jesse Ventura joining us for the next 50 minutes or so live from Baja, Mexico. Amazing Skype connection, despite the fact that he's down there and he's got some amazing stories to tell. Uh, but his crew had the idea that periodically every month or so, Jesse will tape two minutes. Uh, he did it in one take. I did mine in one take as well. Exactly two minutes. And then we sandwich them together. And it... I think we pretty much agreed from different angles on that piece. Jesse was just saying during the break, he thinks uh, it'll be a real debate when, when we talk about illegal immigration. Like we can probably not save that for that. Uh, we can uh, debate that today here uh, as well. Uh, but we're going to cover the waterfront with Jesse. Uh, you can find this piece. It airs over at uh, aura.tv forward slash off the grid or twitter.com forward slash gov J Ventura and Facebook uh, forward slash official Jesse Ventura. We have those all linked up on Infowars.com and PrisonPlanet.com. And you can follow us, of course, at Real Alex Jones and on our different Facebook channels uh, that are listed. What I know about Jesse Ventura, get to know him over now, it's hard to believe, like eight, nine years, is that he's the real deal. And even though we had disagree on probably 30% of the issues, it doesn't matter because at least he's an honorable guy uh, he stands up for basic liberty. I'd call him a libertarian. Uh, he's an anti-establishment party guy. You've heard him here many times. And the system is attacking him and demonizing him and misrepresenting what he says and what he stands for more and more because they're scared of him. And that's why they did the fake thing where he got basically arrested by the police in California at the, at the airport or whatever. Did never happen. Wasn't true. He was in uh, Minnesota. Uh, or the police had stopped him and it was a confrontation, made up. Or the whole American sniper thing, which is now unraveling and, you know, coming out that the movies basically has nothing to do with reality. Why would they try to put him in that book? And I'm sure if Ventura hadn't threatened to sue, probably in the movie. Uh, it's because the establishment is really going after him and anybody else that they know they don't control. Because Jesse Ventura, and then we're going to get to all the issues with him, but for new listeners, we have a lot of new affiliates. I know he's being demonized and attacked wouldn't go for the war when he had a top-rated show back when MSNBC had tens of millions of viewers. So for three years, he was gagged from speaking and played out his contract. Because, and of course, Donahue had some of the top ratings in cable. And they fired him because he wouldn't go along with the war. So that's why I admire Jesse Ventura is because he wouldn't sell out to the establishment and he's a maverick just like InfoWars is. And that's the spirit of what we try to do here. Uh, but overall... Uh, I don't think you'd seen that head-to-head uh, -head piece yet. You just heard it, Jesse. What'd you think of it? I think it worked very well, Alex. Uh, you know, we both made our points. Like you said, we came from, at it from slightly different angles. But I think we both realize the importance of energy independence and uh, uh, that we have to achieve it. And what I've been pushing people very hard on is the fact that oil is old energy. Oil is old. We need to start looking new. We need to start looking beyond. I remember when I met with uh, the scientist John Hutchinson, and he looked at me at the end of our meeting, and he said something to me. He said, do you really believe that scientists like me since 1945 haven't discovered anything beyond the jet engine? And I looked at him and said, no, John, I would think in 50 years of time, you have discovered something better than the jet engine. I remember John smiled and said, how long do you think it would take to go to New York to L.A. if you didn't have to deal with gravity? And just smiled at me. <laughs> well, and, uh, well, and the point I'm making, Alex, is that we need to start looking to the future. Enough of this oil stuff. Oil is old news. It's energy new. It's let's move into the new century with a new outlook on energy and start putting our resources towards finding it. Let's get into energy first because we know that, I remember in the 70s, uh, Chevy had a carburetor that would get you 100 miles uh, to the gallon. I know that the SR-71 Blackbird in service in 1951, they still say is the fastest airplane in the world, when, as you said, the Germans invented jets, the Nazis did, in 1943. So for them to sit around and claim that what we're seeing is the latest, greatest, uh, when the federal government admits that they are trying to block, quote, disruptive technologies, well, they mean disruptive to the grandsons and granddaughters of the robber barons, that pretty much run a monopoly system worldwide. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no. And I agree wholeheartedly, Alex. It's time, you know, uh, one thing about, you know, when I did the three years of conspiracy theory, 
You know, it kind of labeled me and all that by the mainstream media. But I'll tell you, I learned a lot of stuff and talked to a lot of very, very interesting people in doing the three seasons of conspiracy theory. And, uh, you know, it, it really broadened my outlook on a lot of things, uh, doing it and, and hearing things from a, a different point of view and, and hearing people that were out were not in the mainstream. So it was a great learning experience. And we were happy to have you on board for a few of those episodes. You were what did we used to refer to you again uh, from Starsky and Hutch? Who was the black character again? Huggy Bear. Huggy Bear. Yeah. Remember, we used to call you Huggy Bear. <laughs> well, I really enjoyed doing the show as well, and it didn't matter it got top ratings. They actually censored some of the more hardcore episodes that dealt with continuity of government. Now they admit plans for civil unrest. Now, just in the last three years since that episode aired on the police state, they admit the surveillance grid. They admit the threat fusion centers are federalization spy centers. Uh, they admit uh, that they're training for gun confiscation. They admit... Uh, that they're set up an internet kill switch, a Wall Street Journal, from internet to Obamanet. Uh, with, uh, so do you feel vindicated, A, and then B, well, Jesse, why do you think so much is coming out now? Alex, I, I kind of want, I, I, I want people to refer to me now as the prophet. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, sure, I guess we've all no, been warning no, people. I mean, yeah, I, yeah I, I mean, I got to laugh because the very things, how about the, how about the redacted stuff on 9-11? I, I remember going through utter hell because I was questioning there had to be more to 9 11. You than went what to Congress, you pointed out the Saudi connection, you talked to the experts. Absolutely, that 9 11 episode is incredible, and now it's all just out in the open. Yeah, now it's in the open, and, and, and everything that we were saying back then is coming to be the truth. How about the places when they took me to Kansas and they took me to these old missile sites where they're building the. Uh, underground condominiums that hit mainstream a couple months ago that indeed it's happening and it's this and that and you can buy into them i think for 1.3 million you can have a condominium and we covered that in the show years ago so i'm sitting back laughing going you know conspiracy theory really was ahead of its time wasn't it and that's a problem they have jesse again governor jesse ventura uh, joins us Looking at this whole situation, uh, we see uh, CNBC, uh, MSNBC getting rid of a bunch of their crew. MSNBC, CNN's ratings are literally collapsed. It's, it's non-existent uh, from their great days. Fox is slumping as well, but not comparatively. But mainstream media itself is in decline while alternative new media is exploding. Uh, what do you expect the establishment's move to be? Well, obviously, they're going to try to censor the Internet. And they've got experts in the news today saying this new FCC takeover of the web to, quote, protect it, uh, will totally screw it up and bring censorship, Governor. Well, and that's what we've got to fight against. Uh, the, the way they ought to do it is they should, they should move their shows over to the Internet and, and let those that want to see them see them. You know, ultimately, uh, everything comes down to the public's choice. I remember when there used to be all the talk on censorship and what kids should see when I was governor and what they shouldn't see. And I remember always telling people, there's something called the on-off switch and there's something called you can change the channel. That's right. And ulti ultimately, that's what it comes down to is personal responsibility and personal viewership. If, if mainstream media is not delivering what the public wants and needs, the public's going to look other places for it, and you would think they would adapt. So the adaptation has to come from them because, as you said, Alex, we're winning. We're gaining and we're winning. And so they've got to adapt to it. Now, if, there's, if they do it the honest way, they'll get into the, our type of media and try to win people over. Or they'll do it the dishonest way, and that is paying off the politicians, legislating, and bringing the government into it to censor us. So I kind of vote they'll make the move to the second alternative, not the first one, although they should take the first option first. Undoubtedly, I mean, it's now here, bipartisan Republicans and Democrats working together from Internet to Obamanet, 
And we've got the former FCC chief saying he's shocked by Fed's attempts, the article's on screen, to regulate Internet. The order goes far beyond protecting net neutrality. What a perfect cover, though. Say you're going to protect net neutrality that most of us support, uh, and, you know, keeping it open and free, but then actually using it to bring in SOPA and CISPA-style controls. See, Alex, you know what I, how I saw through that? They have already got plenty antitrust laws on the books. All they have to do is apply right. law, laws that existed before the internet. Antitrust laws were here before the internet. All they need, they don't need to pass any new controls. Just apply antitrust laws to the internet. Don't let one or two corporations take it over in a monopoly. It's no different than any other business right. out there. Well, they Jesse, that's what they always do. Pass these new laws. They've got laws in place, Alex. Well, you know that trick as a former uh, mayor and then a governor of a major state where they won't fill the potholes and then they'll demand more taxes to fix that when they just wasted a huge budget. Uh, it's the exact same thing. They say ISIS and Al Qaeda are allowed to recruit on Facebook and Twitter, so pass laws to censor everybody's free speech. Well, I get censored on Facebook and Twitter for just peaceful speech. Your TV shows have been erased off TiVo and off Time Warner. You've been openly censored. I've been openly censored. Uh, they, they've censored Navy SEALs families questioning the official story of their deaths in the Bin Laden raids. So, so they're already censoring stuff that shouldn't be censored. So these claims that we need new laws to stop ISIS recruiting, they're letting ISIS recruit. I want to segue into that. You were on a well, year, I mean, a year ago, two years ago, every time you've been on, and, you've, and, and you can go back to the internet if you want first. And you talked about how it's a false flag. They're funding ISIS. They're funding Al-Qaeda. Uh, this is all staged. It's going to be a wider war. Now, again, that's all official. We're being told brace for uh, the malls to be attacked, a mall of America where you're from up there in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And, and then Jay Johnson says, or give me more funding. I can keep you safe. How transparent does that have to get? Well, it's, it, you know, the whole thing, I, I'll go back into history. Let's go back to the Iraq war and put blame where it belongs, which is what you never hear out of our country. One thing about the United States you can bank on and take it home. We will never admit to a mistake. We will never admit that we made the wrong move. And the wrong move I'm talking about was the original invasion of Iraq. Going back to that. Do you think for one minute ISIS would exist today if Saddam were alive? Do you think ISIS would exist if Gaddafi were alive? No. Those, those countries over there can only survive having a dictator, someone with a powerful position to keep the peace and keep everything in line. The United States invades the country, Gaddafi gets taken out, we take out Saddam, it throws the whole thing into unrest, it throws the whole thing up into the wind, which I have to believe, Alex, is, was their intention. They wanted to make the Middle East unstable. By the way, Wesley Clark just came out. I don't know if you've seen this clip down in Mexico. It just came out two days ago. In fact, try to cue it up, guys, uh, for later. He uh, said that Western governments are behind a destabilization campaign, and he's basically seen the documents, just like he exposed the seven-country plan that they plan to invade. Yeah, no, they, they, I can't believe that this is an all part of a grand master plan to keep the place unstable so that we will be at perennial war. That's right. And the only way to keep us at perennial war is to bring the war home with these threats that ISIS is going to attack us in America. They're going to attack us in America, so therefore we need to fight them over there. It To me... It is. It it goes back to Smedley Butler. War is a racket, and we're sure. involved in the biggest racket of all right now, and that's these wars in the Middle East. We can solve them all. ISIS won't be a problem. Let's do what Ronald Reagan did. Let's do what Ronald Reagan did when the car bomb attacked the Marines in Lebanon and killed 100 brave Marines over there. Did Ronald Reagan go to war? No. Ronald Reagan got the hell out of there. Yeah, let and people kill each today, other. That's not today, our issue. Well, to, well, well, today it's called cutting and running. Ronald Reagan, the pinnacle of the Republican Party, cut and ran. But I agree with Ronald Reagan. He made the right decision. Let's make the right decision and get the hell out of there. Let them decide for themselves who's going to govern who over there. It's so unstable now. It's a regional thing.
and we got no business over there, Alex. Well, the plan is destabilization, just like Ukraine. It's it's the same global chessboard. You know, you've read Brzezinski's book, Grand Chessboard. They admit this whole plan. That's what's so incredibly uh, frustrating about that. But uh, expanding on this, speaking of propaganda wars, uh, you have spoken out, and I'd like you to elaborate on it. Uh, I don't know if you've seen American Sniper yet, but I know you've uh, read uh, the book. For those that don't no. know. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, the only part of that book I've read is my chapter. I didn't need to read anymore. Mine was completely fabricated and it destroyed. I didn't care to read anymore. I have not seen the movie and I've only read one chapter of the book. Well, the movie, um, from what I know, I mean, and, and from what's admitted is, is, is largely cobbled together truths and half truths and then outright uh, fabrications. Uh, it's well, just. It Mm -hmm. It's Hollywoodized, you know, they're going to, they do it with a purpose. Like I here, I put it into the best quote, I think, Alex, I said, it's a propaganda movie with the same, and, and it's as authentic as Dirty Harry. Well, I know you're a big fan because a lot of times when we're <laughs> hanging out, we've uh, talked no, but, about, but, but, sure, I, mean, but, I mean, but you've told me you're a fan of Clint Eastwood. Sure. Uh, uh, I mean, what, has this changed your view or do you just think Clint thought it was a neat book and wanted to make a, a war movie? You know, I don't know what Clint, you know, Clint's in the business to make movies. That's what he does. Uh, it disappointed me that that Clint did it. But, you know, it's not my, you know, Clint's going to do what he wants to do. But I, the point I make about it being Dirty Harry is this. Dirty Harry's a fabrication. You know, you can't go to San Francisco and look up Dirty Harry Callahan in their police and see that he was a police officer there because he wasn't. And that's the point I made about the movie. And the fact that Clint directed it, so it's it's a propaganda movie with the, as authentic as Dirty Harry, which means it's not authentic at all. Absolutely, right down to fake babies. Uh, expanding on that, would you have been upset if they would have thrown in uh, you getting beaten up in the movie? Um, that was one of the reasons it forced me into court. People need to understand this, that they would not talk about restoring my reputation in, in the four settlement official settlement conferences we had the others the kyle side immediately stated we won't admit to fabrication and we will do nothing to restore your reputation we will only talk money i refused because the, the, the this trial for me was not about money it was about the truth and restoring my reputation so they forced me to go to court and yet mainstream media portrayed it, Alex, as you know, I was going after the widow and the children of the war hero. And uh, you know what I'd like to say, Alex? Let's have fun with this for a moment. Let's go back, because I know you understand history well. And I'll, and I'll quiz you on this. This will be a good one. Let's go back to the late 30s, early 40s, when Nazi Germany invaded Poland, right? Yes. OK, let's go back to there. They invade Poland, they overthrow its government, they occupy them. During the occupation, they also torture Polish people, right? The yes. Nazis. Now, if a Nazi soldier during this invasion and occupation were to have killed 150 or 160 Polish people, a Nazi sniper, would that sniper be viewed as a hero? By the Nazis he would, but not by the Allies. Okay, just wanted to hear your opinion on that. So in other words, a hero is in the eye of the beholder. So people of the United States are comfortable with the fact that we invaded a country, we occupied that country, and we tortured the people of that country. And during all of this, some of our women and men in the military doing their jobs killed vast amounts of people in that country. That makes them heroes? Well, I'll say this. What would Americans do if we got invaded by a foreign army? Yes. We would Very fight back good, and we Alex. would be called terrorists. And we would be called insurgents and we'd be terrorists and we'd be all, yeah, good point, Alex. What would happen hypothetically? That's phenomenal. If, if the United States were invaded and somebody from the invading side killed 150 of us, would that person be considered a hero? Well, it's just the classic cowboy story of the Texan out there, you know, fighting 
uh, wanting to do it you know, uh, for his country but not happy about killing people. We know from Kyle's own statements that he loved it. So that's yeah. my problem. Eastwood should have shown him calling him, you know, uh, ragheads and all these other racist terms. They should have shown him getting off on it. They should have shown all that and shown the real thing, uh, not the other thing. And, and what's sad here is Saudi Arabia, we now know, well, quarterback 9-11, we go attack their enemy Iraq. Iraq didn't do anything. And so that's what makes this so evil. Jesse, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. I agree with you, Alex. Uh, you know, when I made this statement, I think I said it on uh, on, on uh, Alan Combs' radio show. As a veteran, they, they destroyed my American dream with Iraq because I never believed in my heart. And my mother and father were both WW2 vets. And uh, I never believed in all my heart that I would see the United States line up our military at another sovereign nation's border, lie to us, giving us reasons why they should go in, that we would invade a country, overthrow its government, and occupy the country. And then worst of all, torture people, torture people. And then and then, we nobody in this country will admit that what we did in Iraq was so wrong. Jesse Ventura, stay there. We're back in 70 seconds. ...about how our allies are involved with ISIS and funding them. Here's the clip. Look, ISIS got started through funding from our friends and allies, because as people will tell you in the region, if you want somebody who will fight to the death against Hezbollah, you don't put out a recruiting poster and say, you know, sign up for us, or we're gonna make a better world. You go after zealots, and you go after these religious fundamentalists. That's who fights Hezbollah. But General, I'm hearing you it's on It's like it. a Frankenstein. <laughs> okay, and then they go on from there, but for five years they've been funding the Free Syrian Army. Two years ago our own military came out, so we're not going to be their Air Force. Ted Cruz and Rand Paul, to their credit, came out and said that. So they just changed the name. And Jesse Ventura was here at the time predicting it, breaking it down accurately. We were as well. We've been proven right yet again. And I'm not bragging. It's, it's not that hard to figure this out once you understand the paradigm uh, of how this works. And now these groups are set to attack us. And they'll try to take our liberties. Governor Ventura, this is a short segment, long segment coming up, but finishing up with terrorism. Uh, I'm really concerned about a major event here so they can finish their police state. Well, I am too. You know, I, I you know, will that event be a false flag operation? Uh, wh who will really be running it to make it happen? And uh, I fear it also. I've also said that, I, I, that another one's going to happen. And, you know, to me, the Boston Marathon was a practice run through where they brought in uh, the federal troops to and told people to stay in their homes and all that stuff like a like a martial law type situation and certainly if we do get hit with something say, hopefully not at the mall of america but if they do get hit in some type of situation like that you can bet the government's going to step in and go through a lockdown procedure and it's going to depend on whether the american people accept that type of uh are they willing to give up their freedoms for safety? Jesse, and, let me uh, ask you I'm this not, question. And I'm not. I'm not either. Let me ask you this question. Obviously, they're worried about economic collapse, other issues. But why are the people that run this country accelerating classical police state? Why do they want it in place? And why are they pointing it at the American people? Because it's power. Because it's, uh, uh, you know, the separation between the wealthy and the poor. Uh, it may be part of the of the globalization you talk about, Alex, because they can't put us on par with Mexico till they destroy the middle class. That's right. Then you'll then you'll have rich, and then you'll have poor, and that's basically what Mexico has: rich and poor. You know, and and then they can put us on the, all the same currency like they've done to Europe. You know, and and then it'll work here too. Then I guess. And so, who and and one thing in order to accomplish that, they have to destroy our Bill of Rights, because Mexico and other countries don't have bills of rights, and uh, we do, or we used to. I would question whether we actually do today or not. I don't know because it's being violated constantly. That's why I urge. I tell people, young men and women that are enlisting in the military service, I always tell them, remember, you're taking an oath to protect the Constitution and Bill of Rights from all enemies, foreign and domestic. Never forget that. Never forget the oath to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights.
That's right. There's a bunch of issues I want to get into in the 25 minutes we have left when we go to break. But you're kind of making my case for me about Constitution. Government can't act unilaterally. Uh, and, you know, you basically don't want to be a third world country like Mexico. I'm not against the immigrants. And we'll uh, debate it when we come back briefly or longer if you want. It's that they're being used as a tool to drive down wages and as a new Democratic voting block, the Democrats admit this, to vote for gun control and things. So I'm not against the immigrants. I'm against how they're geopolitically being used. So, Governor, we'll come back to you on the other side, Jesse Ventura, and I'll kind of restate that for stations that join us, and then you can give me your take on it. So we'll briefly debate that. And then it's a wild card. I'm going to ask Governor Ventura what he thinks is uh, important and, and get into some of the subjects he wants to cover. He's been a radio talk show host longer than I have, so I'm sure, sure he can uh, direct the show. Stay with us. Iraq accuses Britain, and they have evidence, of delivering weapons to Islamic State. They've come out and said, the government of Iraq, we know you're really behind it in Saudi Arabia. Ex-FCC chief shocked by Fed's attempt to regulate the Internet. If you go to my Twitter account at Real Alex Jones, it is mind-blowing, the links and articles we've got there. Two days left. Two days left until uh, this incredibly important... A uh, piece of legislation will be voted on that will change the web forever. And no one has even seen the FCC's 332-page regulation plan. That's an article up on Infowars.com. And you've got this these different uh, Pacific partnerships and deals that are secret that Congress can't even see. I mean, talk about global government. We're in it. We're going to talk about that in a moment with Jesse Ventura. And Jesse... I found nine times out of ten, we don't really disagree on things, and it's fine to disagree. We just have different perspectives. I get hardworking immigrants are what made this country. I get that uh, you live down in Mexico at least four or five months out of the year in Baja, and you like it, and you like the people. I, and I understand the U.S. already, uh, under the age of about 12, is half Hispanic. So America is, is a Hispanic nation, the United States. It's going to be more so. White people and blacks don't have babies. Uh, whatever, I don't care. I like, quote, Hispanics, okay? My issue is that the Ford Foundation, the globalists, are pushing for open borders. Obama's doing it without Congress. Most of the Republican leadership wanted as well. They get here, it was in CBS News, they order the police to not even arrest illegals for drunk driving. So uh, they get all this extra welfare. They can cut from China. Women come here, CNN reported, and have their babies, and we pay for them. Nobody else does that, Jesse. So I'm saying I'm not against the immigrants. I know if people are here, hardworking, we should have find a way path towards citizenship. But instead, I see the whole police state only for citizens, as Ron Paul said, the fence is to keep us in, not the illegals out. And I see this entitlement uh, of the illegals that they should get everything for free. That's my issue. And I think the border being pretty much open in many areas shows the war on terror is a fraud. So that's my two minutes head to head with Jesse Ventura live on immigration. Explain your position and uh, any counter arguments you have, uh, Governor. Well, the, the problem is this. If those things are going on, Alex, then blame our Democrats and Republicans and our politicians for creating programs that can be so easily abused. I agree. How hard, how hard can it be to say you have to be a citizen in which to get welfare? Seems pretty straightforward to me. But they create a system that can be looped all the time. And then when somebody loops it, we always blame the person that loops the system. Blame the people that created the system. Now, in speaking about freedom, okay, I'll give it to you from a different perspective. Let's say I'm a business owner and what I'm involved in, I, I hire people, I do the proper thing, I deduct taxes properly, the whole ball of wax. Why shouldn't I have the freedom to hire who I want and why should being a citizen have any part of it? I mean, if I wanted to get roofers or people that work with cement, I guarantee you I'm going to look for Mexican people because they, they, when they do cement, they're not cement workers. They're artists. I've watched them, and they, they're, they're remarkable. And if you look at any roofing crew in America today, at least up in Minnesota, they're all Hispanic on those roofs. So if you're, don't you, shouldn't an employer have the freedom to hire who they want who can get the job done? And as long as they deduct properly, those people can't even get a tax refund. 
they work and it goes into the taxes and it you know they don't get refunded any of the money. Well, that's if being that's employee, being changed. What about the giving the illegals are doing the right thing? See, if the employers are not doing the right thing, which are United States people, and they're not deducting taxes and they're not doing it on the up and up, well, then they're the ones to blame, not the worker. Well, I don't sit there and hate people from Latin America that want a better well, life. Well, I know that, Alex. I'm just giving you my opinion that freedom also should be the freedom to hire who I want. If sure. I'm a United States businessman, and why should being a citizen be part of it? Why, why, why does U.S. citizenship have anything to do with who I would hire to get the job done? But listen, what I'm getting at, and, and your points are valid, I can't go to Mexico and have a baby and have it paid for for free. They'd laugh at me. So this whole system is being exploited by design for corporate welfare and hospital well, welfare. Well, then get the people who wrote the laws. I agree. Blame the Democrats and Republicans. Don't blame the person who uses the law to their advantage. Sure. Blame the people who did the law that allows it to be taken advantage of. Well, I do. Which goes right back to the Democrats and Republicans. Yes, and that's why I'm trying to block their latest agendas that are just more of the same. Uh, and then they always make it about, hey, don't be mean to the immigrants. Well, I, I mean, come on. So many of the immigrants are fleeing uh, criminal past. They can come up here and use any ID they want. I mean, in California, I, Alex, they're giving I, the illegals driver's license, and, they, and then they can vote. Should illegals who aren't citizens be able to vote? No, and I don't believe they are. Uh, we did. We have as much immigration as anybody in the nation up in Minnesota, and we did a huge study when I was up there on campaign fraud, voter fraud. It's so minute. That's the biggest red herring out there that people are committing vote. What criminal, you ever met a criminal that says, you know what, it's November. I think that means voter fraud. I'm gonna go vote illegally. Well, I don't I've think of the classic illegals that. as criminals just because they're violating federal law no, 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 and, no, and, Alex, and breaking a law. Nobody, the, point the Democrats are organizing them and they are voting. Nobody commits voter fraud. It's a, That's a red herring out there. That's a red herring. We did a study when I was governor, it was, you couldn't have won an election on voter fraud in Minnesota. There weren't enough votes. Well, Jesse, that was in your state and what, 15 years ago or 12, 14 years ago. Uh, they're now just giving them driver's license and letting them vote uh, in California. And they, they uh, don't have to take a driver's test. They don't have to get behind the wheel. Nope, they give it to them. I mean, yes, they go take the test. They don't, have, so they don't have to do nothing. They just show up and they hand them a driver's no, license. No, they well, go that, and they take the driver's test. And that's California's fault. That should be dealt with by the state of California, not the federal government, because the federal government has nothing to do with I, driver's Listen, license. I agree with you. I, we need immigrants rights. in this country, but we don't need uh, mothers with no skills with three kids who are immediately signed on to welfare the day they get here. Well... <laughs> <laughs> I'm only la I'm only laughing because I'm thinking back to when I was governor, and I met the it, it, we were putting the budget together, and all the welfare protesters were out in front of the Capitol, and I remember I went down to talk to them, which no governor had ever done, and I remember a woman with her baby yelling at me that I was responsible for her and her child, and I remember looking at her and saying, "Well, where's your husband?" And he she said he ran off. And I looked at her and I said, well, so I'm responsible because you married a bum? <laughs> and somehow it comes to my, my responsibility? And I remember Rush Limbaugh, I was his hero for like 30 days, you know, this new independent governor who said this. The point I'm making is that our system is violated because the people that make the system allow it to be violated. So if you want the system to not be violated, you have to blame the people that create it for allowing that to happen. Don't blame the people that find the loopholes. Find the people that allowed the loopholes in the first place. I totally agree with what you're saying, but they can just take what I say or you say out of context. And we need to get the public focused on actually stopping all these different loopholes uh, and dealing with a special interest. Let's shift gears. You know, you, know what's, you know what's so weird, Alex? I cross the border every year twice. And when I go into Mexico, sometimes there's nobody even there. I mean, I've actually stopped my vehicle and rolled my windows down and said, well, doesn't somebody at least say buenos dias and hand you a piece of paper? No. 
They, they're not worried that I'm coming into their country. They care. I got pesos. I'm going to spend some and it's going to spur the economy. Yet when I turn around and come back into my own country, my country, I've had times where seven lanes of traffic, I've had to wait three hours in the blistering 99 degree where I've seen where I can prove to you that global warming and ch climate change is real. Because while I'm sitting in my pickup truck, the temperature's gone from 99 degrees in the desert all the way to 116 while I'm simply waiting to cross into my country, which repels me like I'm some sort of rabid monster. And then, you know what the first thing they ask you, Alex, when you come back to your own country? You know what the first question is? What is it? Without a doubt, I can verbatim, how long have you been in Mexico? And I think to myself, how is that any of your business? Whether I'm in Mexico one day or whether I went there for nine months, it's really none of your business how long I've been in Mexico. I have a legitimate passport. This is my country. I'm coming back to my country. Why do you need to know how long I've been in Mexico? Jesse Ventura is our guest. It's funny you bring up uh, climate change because it is a very seriously complex uh, issue. And when we come back from break, I want to cover this as our final subject. Obviously, there's weather manipulation going on. But when we say global warming, now they're saying climate change, period, that we're denying that. Climate change is always happening. No one denies that there aren't heat sinks in cities with all the engines and all the concrete that it doesn't go up 5, 10 degrees. What we're saying is there's solution to it is global taxation and regulation. So I want to get your view on that. And this London Guardian article from February 15th, spy agencies fund climate research in hunt for weather weapon, scientists fear. The London Guardian reads like an episode of your show from Harp, one of the scientists that helped develop this. So what I'm concerned about is they're already manipulating the weather, that's admitted, uh, and weaponizing it. We'll be back with our final segment with Jesse Ventura. I'm Alex Jones with Infowars.com. Check out his TV show at Aura.tv forward slash off the grid or on Twitter at GovJVentura. Follow us on Twitter, Real Alex Jones. Stay with us. Hey, again, I'm Alex Jones coming to you from deep in the heart of Texas, Austin. Uh, so we went to break. Spy agencies fund climate research in hunt for weather weapons, scientists fears. U.S. expert Alan Roebuck raises concerns over who would control climate-altering technologies if research is paid for by intelligence agencies. Well, it's already going on. Billions a year by the Department of Energy, HARP, and others. You've been to HARP. You've investigated it. The Russians, uh, folks in Dubai, they admit they can already control the weather. I've had the former head of weather weapons for the U.S. government, Ben Livingston, on. They were controlling and steering and uh, killing hurricanes back in the 60s. Now, what do you think is really going on with the weather, Jesse Ventura, and all these earthquakes we're seeing in Miami and, 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 and Oklahoma? What's going on? Well, part of that's fracking. You know, fracking sure. is causing earthquakes. We know that for a fact. But what's going on? They're violating treaty agreements. They've, they're signed treaties that nobody can use the weather for war. That's right. And yet, and yet here we are violating them behind the back, and nobody's going to do anything about it anywhere in the world. You know, uh, I don't know what to say about it. It's, it's ridiculous. You start messing with Mother Nature, and Mother Nature's going to come back and bite you. What are you, you most just, concerned about in the world? Uh, I mean, do you think humanity's going to survive? I Well, I want to believe it is, but I'll tell you what, I've been down here in the Baja now for 10 years, and maybe some of it's due to the hurricane that hit here, which was devastating earlier this past fall, but out where I live, Alex, I'm not seeing the fish this year like I've seen them in past years. There's no, there's no sardine swarms that I'd see five or six of them a day, these hot spots of sardines. I'm not seeing that anymore. There's nothing dead on the beaches anymore. You can't be dead on the beach if nothing in the water is alive. That's right, and, and Fukushima started melting down again this week, and that's what we've got in mainline scientific reports. They're saying much of the northern Pacific is deader than a doornail. Well, I don't know why, what. The whales are here, I will say that. The whales are surviving. I'm seeing plenty of whales, but I'm worried about the other things I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing a lot of seagulls. 
which or not seagulls, but uh, what's the ones that's uh, pelicans? Pelicans. There you go. I'm not seeing. I used to see them. They were like fighter formations down here. You'd see five or six a day with 20 of them in a group flying in formation. Unbelievable. Today, I see a single pelican here and there. I finally saw a couple formations the other day. So I don't know if the hurricane threw everything off here or I don't know. And I'll tell you what's going on down here. It isn't the sport fishing. It isn't the uh, the Mexicans and their banca boats fishing. They've been doing it for years. It's these trawlers. They're out at night. I see them. They're five abreast. They drag these nets and they literally sweep the bottom of everything that exists. Well, that's a big part of it. And you know about a real environmental crisis. Uh, overfishing is devastating uh, fish populations worldwide, and something needs to be done about it. Uh, that that is a real environmental crisis, in my view. Yeah, it, I mean, I'm living it down here. I've seen uh, Alex. I didn't think in one decade I would see the change down here that I've seen in one decade as far as the wildlife goes in the ocean down here. Well, I tell you, it is. Remember, uh, this is the place Jacques Cousteau. Jacques Cousteau bought the Calypso, his ship here, parked it here for two to three years and said, this is paradise. I don't think he might say that today. Wow, real environmental crisis. Undoubtedly, humans are causing some big problems, but uh, the globalists just use that to divert us off into things that give them more power and don't fix the problems. Uh, well, oh, Alex, always remember what one of my heroes, George Carlin, said. You know why we're here, don't you, humans on Earth? Why? Alex? Well, the Earth needed plastic. <laughs> you know, the, the Earth can produce anything else. The one thing the Earth cannot produce is plastic. So that's <laughs> the reason humans came, because humans know how to make plastic. And the Earth needed plastic. Because other than that, we are simply a consumer. We, do, we give nothing back. We only take. Well, if you look out in the Pacific, they say that there is a garbage uh, island bigger than Texas floating out off the coast of the United States in between Japan. Imagine if that thing ever comes ashore. Governor Ventura, I'm not kissing your butt. It is like the fountain of youth down there. You look like you've lost 15, 20 pounds. You look 10 years younger. What are you doing? Well, I'm, uh, I, I do a four-mile walk every morning in the desert with four-pound weights on each ankle. And you're doing some surfing. Well, I'm getting them and I'm doing a lot of old dumbbell training. You know, I don't have all the mechanized machines off the grid. We're ducking and hiding from the drones all the time. That's why Abraham's always dirty. He's scrambling Jesse, around. we're out of time. And Thanks for up. joining us. All Th right, Alex. We'll see you next time. Thanks a lot, buddy. There goes Jesse Ventura on we're our on show. The, march. the Empire.